everyone, it's Bree from Reading Rev. And as you know, we are doing a series on language comprehension this quarter. So our first blog was all about background knowledge and helping kids gain the background knowledge that will make reading comprehension accessible to them. The second week that we, um, the second blog that we put out was about vocabulary and teaching, systematically teaching vocabulary, especially tier two words. And then today's blog is all about language and syntax and really breaking down this complex idea of how words work together in a sentence and breaking it down into just four big ideas. So I think sometimes kids and teachers get really overwhelmed by all of the patterns and all of the rules of phonics and morphology and spelling and writing mechanics and sentences and grammar and it just feels very daunting. But if we can show kids that really our language is just a code and that when we break it down into the, this code, we can kind of start seeing patterns that make it not as complex as it first appears. So we're going to talk about syntax today, and we've broken all of the ideas about syntax down into just four big components that will let kids and teachers understand syntax a little better. So I decided instead of trying to write and blog about all of these ideas, I would just simply present the slideshow that I actually made for kids and walk you through how I teach this with students. There are a few slides in this deck that I um, would hide when I teach it to kids, but in the notes section of those slides, I actually say hide for students. And so some of the slides just give you background information as a teacher, but you can take this slideshow and um, hide those slides and use this exact deck with kids. This is what I use with my third through fifth grade students. So let's get started. First of all, what is syntax? Syntax is the arrangement of words and phrases to create well-formed sentences in language. So the idea of grammar is tricky because a lot of times people think of grammar as just parts of speech, but really this idea of syntax is the umbrella of how words go together to make sentences work. And the truth is that if students are struggling to have comprehension at the sentence level, then they are not going to have comprehension at the conversation level or at the paragraph and text level. So we really need to make sure that kids understand how the pattern of how words go together to form a sentence. And this will aid them in not only their um, oral language comprehension, but also their reading comprehension and their writing. So it's really, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. So when toddlers learn to speak, they don't have syntax mastered, right? And oftentimes their subjects and their predicates don't quite work and they are running and they're speaking in run-ons and they're speaking in fragments. And it's adorable when two and three-year-olds speak without great syntax. But the problem is it's not adorable when older kids are struggling with syntax. In fact, it's distracting. And you can really kind of see the breakdown in syntax when kids start to write, even if they can speak orally. And there's been a lot of studies that, that oral language is a predictor of comprehension, but also is an early predictor of reading comprehension. So if you have a student struggling with comprehending orally, they're gonna really struggle when, they, when it comes to reading. So the rules that govern, govern our language really need to be explicitly taught. And I think that a lot of kids enter kindergarten with this kind of idea of sentence structure, especially oral sentence structure in place, but what happens when they don't? So here are the four big ideas of syntax that we're gonna break down. And I'm gonna break down each one of these tonight. I've broken these down for my students um, at different varying lengths, and I'll explain kind of how I know when to move on. So here are the four big ideas of syntax. The first one is every sentence, every complete sentence needs a capital, a subject, a predicate, and an end mark. And the capital letter is kind of a visual indicator that a new sentence is starting. An end mark is a visual indicator, indicator that 
the sentence is ending, and a sentence that doesn't have a subject and a predicate is not a complete thought. The second big idea is that if we spoke in just very simplistic, short, simple sentences that only had subjects and predicates, we would sound like a robot and it would be very, very simplistic. So we need to teach kids how to expand simple, short sentences. And the best way to do that is to teach them the parts of speech. So rather than just doing rote memorization of parts of speech and a grammar textbook that breaks down um, adverbs and adjectives and prepositions, instead, if we show them that these parts of speech are actually their guides for expanding sentences so that their readers can think about it and can visualize, then suddenly it doesn't seem so abstract and disconnected and frivolous or, or unnecessary. The next idea is that if we understand clauses and we know how to combine clauses, we can elevate our writing and elevate our speech. So we don't talk in simple sentences. And so to really understand clauses is the key to advanced mature writing. And then the final one is that phrases give our readers more information and clarity. So we can take a very simple sentence with a subject and a predicate, and we can add some clauses which are, is going to build our readers' comprehension. So let's talk about each one of those. I give my students this um, packet at the very beginning of our unit, and depending on the age that you're teaching or the maturity um, of your students, you can decide of the four which of those patterns you're going to teach and how in depth that you want to go. You can teach this very surface level and very basically, or you can dive really deep in. Um, this packet, if you print it the correct way, and I'll give you directions to that, but if you print it the right way, then the note page is, I do the staples on the top, so it's flipping on the short side instead of the long side in your printer. Then the note pages are on the top and the student um, text is on the bottom. And the beautiful thing about this is that I really do um, I do, we do, you do for this modeling. And the first one or two sentences we write together and they are simply just copying perfect sentences. It's the model idea. And then as we go through the week, then the last sentence, you're gonna notice that last box has a green line around it. And that one is one that I let them do completely independently. And what that really is, is I'm monitoring their progress and I'm seeing if they've captured, if they've mastered that idea or if I need to spend more time um, on that concept. So this is a great way, each um, sentence is dated, you can do one or two sentences a day, and it's a great way to um, have progress monitoring if you are intervening with a student. It's also a great way to show growth and mastery and um, have that as, a, um, as an assessment. So let's talk about the first big idea. This first idea about a complete sentence can be taught to kindergarten and first graders. And I love the idea of teaching kids the vocabulary of literacy. Teach kids what the subject is, use the word subject. Teach kids what a predicate is and use the word predicate. And if you teach this, then really small kids are capable of understanding and then they have a baseline knowledge that you can keep adding complexity to rather than making cute names that you are going to um, have to reteach the real name later anyway. If the kids can um, learn the word Tyrannosaurus Rex as a first grader, they can definitely learn the word subject. So this is the big idea. A complete sentence has two parts. It starts with a capital letter and it ends with an end mark. A subject is who or what we are talking about, and the predicate is what we are saying about that. So every sentence that we write or speak, we should make sure that we have these four things. And with students, then I'm like, so let's practice. What is this a picture of? And, and we're speaking in complete sentences and we're writing in complete sentences. But I want this to be very, very simple. Give me a sentence that just has who we're talking about and what we're saying about it. So the students would most likely say, the teacher sings. Um, I've had teacher, uh, students say, the teacher screams, the teacher yells, the teacher's crazy, but the teacher sings, we're gonna just be positive and assume positive intention, the teacher sings. Who sings? The teacher, subject. What does the teacher do? 
predicate, sings predicate. And then I say, let's check and make sure that this is indeed a complete sentence. Does it have a capital? Yes. Does it have a subject? Yes. Does it have a predicate? Yes. Does it have an end mark? Yes. Okay, let's do another one. Give me a sentence as simple as you can about what's happening in this picture. And again, let's be positive. The tigers play. Um, lots of kids want the tigers to be fighting. That's also okay. But the tigers play is simple. The tigers play. Who plays? The tigers. Subject. What do the tigers do? Play. Predicate. Let's make sure that this is a complete sentence. Does it have a capital? Does it have a subject? Does it have a predicate? Does it have an end mark? Okay, well, what happens if we write a sentence or speak a sentence that does not have a subject or does not have a predicate? We call that a fragment. And I usually do a little vocabulary lesson here and talk about what fragments are and, and how things can be fragmented. But let's look at some sentences that are missing one of those parts and see how confusing they are. The burning house. What about the burning house? And the kids will start filling it in for you, right? So the kids start actually making it a complete sense. And I'm like, huh, that's not what it says. It just says the burning house. And it leaves us, what about the burning house? That sentence has a subject, but it doesn't tell us what about the burning house. How about this one? Ran away quickly. And the kids start talking about like, well, who ran away quickly? And I'm like, exactly, it has a predicate, but it's missing a subject. And we're really left like with this fragmented idea and we don't really know what to think about it. How about this one? A surprise party. Again, why, why, right? So let's take a look at what happens when we add lots of sentences and we just push them all together and we don't correctly punctuate it. We don't have a capital and an end mark. We don't stop it. We call that a run on. And listen to these sentences. The burning house crumbled, the firefighter got there, and the woman sat on the sidewalk crying. <gasps> and I do it that dramatically. I make a big deal of like, I, I don't know when to take a breath. I don't know where to start and stop. I'm, it's just like exhausting and, and hard to read, right? How about this one? A frog sang on the lily pad and the dog howled at the moon. <gasps> and you're like, wait, what? Like, where? when do I start? When do I stop? And run-ons. I'm in cognitive overload trying to figure that out, and I can't really comprehend what is actually happening in the sentence. Today is the best day. I got a brand new bike. It is so awesome. So I tell kids, like, when you're writing and run, writing with run-on sentences, as a reader, it's really distracting, and it's really hard, and especially hard to read out loud because you don't know when to take a breath. So then I give the kids some opportunities to practice and identify, and they can write on their desk an S for a simple sentence, um, A, or S for a sentence, F for a fragment, R for a run on, and I show that. They made a great dinner for the family. Yeah, this has a subject. Who made a great dinner? They, subject. What did they do? They made a great dinner for the family. Predicate, and it has a capital and an end mark. So if you have an S on your desk, you are correct. How about this one? Burned and ruined. What was burned and ruined? It's a fragment. I don't know. I don't have a subject, right? Something was burned and ruined. I don't know what it was. Toby, Maria, Jake, and Juan. What about them, right? So now I have a subject. I have a who, but I don't have a what. I don't have a what about them. So that's also a fragment. We ran to the store and bought some takeout. Instead, they were, and they were grateful. And I'm like, what? I don't even understand what that sentence means. Like, do you see how run-ons, it's like kind of just like confusing, right? So that was a run-on and we need to make sure that we're writing complete sentences. Okay, so in their packets, I would then show them um, some other pictures. I would have them hopefully connect it to real content and real text. So if we're reading a novel, then I'm going to um, read a little bit of our novel and then stop. And we are going to create sentences about content and about building background knowledge. Hopefully, maybe we're building sentences about um, about the life cycle of a butterfly because that's what we're learning in science. So the more that you can you can connect this to real content, you're building background knowledge. You can utilize and integrate vocabulary that you've taught, and you're also building reading comprehension language comprehension, 
and it's going to absolutely benefit their writing. Here's the second big idea. So I teach um, complete sentences until I feel like 80% of my class has mastered that. When 80% have mastered, then I go on to the next concept. If I have a few stragglers that are still writing in fragments or still writing in subjects, then I'm going to pull them into small group and I'm going to do really good multi-sensory things. Maybe I'm writing subjects on yellow cards, um, predicates on orange cards, and I'm actually having them build sentences on my table. In fact, I, I often start that way with the whole group and then scaffold back and um, just help those 20% that haven't quite mastered it. But for the 80%, we move on to idea number two. So we wouldn't want to just say the teacher sings, the tigers play, because as a reader, I can't really visualize that. So what I'm hoping to do as a writer or as a speaker is give enough information that my, my listener or my reader can visualize it and can comprehend. So we're not writing for ourselves typically, sometimes we do, but most of the time we're writing for an, an, um, an audience and we can expand short and simple sentences by understanding parts of speech. Usually by third and fourth grade, my kids have at least a general understanding of nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs, hopefully. If not, you might need to go back and do some reteaching. But this is a perfect way for them to see a authentic purpose of knowing parts of speech. Because otherwise, if you're just in a grammar worksheet and you're just labeling adjectives and adverbs, it's going to seem irrelevant, right? It's going to seem like busy work and, and disjointed and like, when am I ever going to use this? Here's how you use it. So we can make short, simple sentences more interesting by adding detail and expanding them. Our readers will be able to comprehend and visualize our ideas. And knowing the parts of speech can help us do this. So let's start with adjectives. Adjectives are words that describe nouns or pronouns. So adjectives answer the question, what kind, which one, how many? So I am going to give you a short, simple sentence, the dog sat. What kind of dog? And the kids all say, wiener dog. Which one? The tiny one, the brown one. Um, how many? One, right? So let's describe all the things that you can tell me about this, this little dog. And the kids are laughing, they're engaged, it's, it's exciting and fun. And I let them, I usually have this up on my board where I'm like writing their ideas. And then I present another option. One adorable brown wiener dog sat. And it still doesn't give me a clear picture about what he's doing, about the predicate part, but adjectives are describing the subject part of the sentence. And then I show them, we might just do adjectives for one day and in our text or in our, um, our science book or whatever, we, whatever text we have at the center of our lesson, then we are going to describe and write those sentences in, um, on the packet that they have. And we're gonna make sure that we're still checking capital and mark subject predicate, but now let's give our reader some more information to, dis to visualize our subject. Then we move on to adverbs, and adverbs are used to describe the predicate part of the sentence. So how, when, and to what extent. So I show them this sentence, the kids jump, and I have them close their eyes. I'm like, just visualize the kids jump. It could mean a thousand things, right? I don't know anything about really what to visualize because I don't have very much detail. So I let them play around. How do they jump? When do they jump? How, to what extent do they jump? And we come up with three laughing kids jump really high. And so I'm describing how many and what kind of kids, which ones, adjectives. And I'm also building on how do they jump? They jump high. To what extent how high? Really high. And the final way that you can really pretty basically extend sentences, and you can do this with pretty young kids, is to teach them the prepositional phrase. So a prepositional phrase inside the word preposition is the word um, position. So it gives us more information about um, position in time or place. So we could have the plane is flying. And then let's talk about where the plane is flying. 
when the plane is flying. The large passenger plane, plane is steadily flying under the cloud during a storm. So I break down and show like, wow, the plane is flying. You could visualize a thousand different things. But this sentence with adjectives, adverbs, and prepositional phrases, now I can visualize what kind of plane, how is it flying, and where and when is it flying. And this is, again, a complete sentence. Check for capital. Check for end mark. Does it have a subject? What is steadily flying? Plane. Subject. What is the plane doing? Flying. Predicate. So that is the second big idea. And I, um, again, I do, we do, you do or you do, right? So I model this for them. I um, let us practice and build sentences together. And then I kind of do a, an assessment of like, where are you at? Okay, you do one all by yourself. The monkey eats. I want you to make sure you have a complete sentence. I want you to give me as much information so that I can visualize this image as specifically as, as you can. And I just let them write their own sentence. And as I'm walking around, it's a formative assessment of I'm like, ooh, you got it. You, you're doing all the things. This kid is still writing a run on or a fragment. I'm gonna need to, to do more. So this is the one that we actually came up with as a class for my um, fourth graders. Mischievous Monkley quickly eats the stolen banana before he gets caught. That is so much more informative um, for our reader than just the monkey eats. And again, you can find really amazing pictures that the kids will automatically kind of be invested in and, and want to, to write about, or better yet, you can connect this to content. Okay, idea three. So now we have really good complete sentences. But if you want to be a mature, sophisticated writer, and impress all of your readers, then you can combine sentences. And if you know how to punctuate them, you can elevate your writing, right? This is, this is where things get really interesting. But in order to be able to combine sentences without just rambling on with run-ons, you have to understand clauses. So, Instead of writing lots of short, simple sentences, we can combine related sentences. We must punctuate these sentences correctly so it's not a run on. This would be very simplistic, great sentences for a first grader. I like hockey. Hockey is fun. It is exciting. Complete sentences followed our four things. Has a capital, has a subject, has a predicate, has an end mark, we're good. Not very informative and also very short and choppy. My writer, my reader and writer are not, or my reader and, um, and listener are not gonna be very engaged. So let's talk about clauses. A clause is a group of words that has a subject and a predicate. Might sound just like what we just said of sentences, right? There are two kinds of clauses. An independent clause can stand alone. A dependent clause cannot stand alone. So sometimes we can have a clause that is not a complete sentence. It can't stand alone. And I taught, I relate this to Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus. And I say, if you went to the mall in December and Santa was there by himself, you'd be like, Santa, right? It would make sense. You're, you're expecting him. It, everything is complete. But if you went to the mall and just saw Mrs. Claus, and she was alone, you'd look around and be like, something's missing, where's Santa? Her identity depends on him, right? In fact, we call her Mrs. Claus, and I did a Google search to even like find out what her first name is, and there's like four different names that people think. We don't even know this lady's first name. Her identity is so dependent on Santa. So this kind of helps kids um, understand those two vocabulary words, and we can talk about um, you know, who are independent people, what are, what would a dependent, a baby is dependent, a, um, an adult is hopefully independent. We can talk about really getting used to those vocabulary words, and so they understand um, those two terms. So, we have compound words. That's when you take two words that make sense by themselves, like rainbow, and we put them together, and we have a compound word, rainbow. We also have something kind of cool in science, 
called a compound molecule. And this is like water is two hydrogens and an oxygen, and together we call them a compound, right? So it's taking two independent things. Oxygen can be by itself, hydrogen can be by itself. We put them together and it's a compound. And we can also have two independent clauses together. We call that a compound. So we're tying in um, kind of overarching vocabulary. There are two ways that you can punctuate when you put two independent clauses together. If you just put them together, you have a run on. There are two ways that you can punctuate them correctly. The first way is that you can write your first independent clause, put a comma, have a coordinating conjunction, and then another independent clause. That is correct. The second way is one of my favorite ways. It's going to make you look very, very smart. It is to use a semicolon to join two independent clauses. And when you do it this way, it's kind of it's kind of powerful because we don't do it very often. So let's take a look at that. Con means with, junct means join. So a conjunction is literally when we're joining something. And what we happen to be joining now is independent clauses. We have to use a coordinating conjunction with a comma or we have a run on. So we call this independent comma coordinating conjunction independent. We call this compound sentence and that's how we, the first way that we can punctuate it. So the second way we can punctuate it is when we just slide two independent clauses together, but we use a, a semicolon. And we want to only do this when we want our reader to be really impressed. Like it's a powerful connection, right? These two things are so related and joined that we use a semicolon to show that it's kind of a more powerful way. Okay, so let's try it. We could say just a simple sentence. The bear ate. Okay, I wouldn't be able to visualize very much. I could say the fish was dinner. Okay, I still don't have a great idea of what happened. Let's use some coordinating conjunctions and join these two ideas and make a complete compound sentence. Here's one, away, one idea. The determined salmon leapt. Ooh, that's a complete sentence. Who leapt? The salmon, subject. What did the salmon do? Leapt, predicate. What kind of salmon? Oh, he was determined. Not easy what he's doing. That's a great vocabulary word. The determined salmon leapt. I could put a, pen, a period and have that be a complete sentence. But I want to tie it into this other idea. He instantly became the hungry grizzly bear's dinner. Ooh, he became dinner is a complete sentence. Who became dinner? He. What are we saying about him? He became dinner, predicate. And then I'm going to add some adjectives and, and adverbs to make you have an even clearer picture. What kind of bear? A hungry bear, a hungry grizzly bear. How, to what extent did he become dinner? Instantly. And then let kids write their own, they're creative, they're engaged, it's powerful. It is not a worksheet where they're identifying and underlining independent clause once and dependent clause twice. This is a, an authentic way for them to see the connection between language and writing and grammar and syntax. And by the way, for kids that struggle with language comprehension, they're struggling to, to visualize, they're struggling to comprehend what we say or especially what they read. By doing these checks all the time about complete sentences and subject and predicates, you're aiding in their language comprehension. Who leapt again? Oh yeah, that determined salmon. And you're giving them visuals, you're giving them, you're building their language, you're building their background knowledge, you're building their vocabulary. And then I'll let kids try it again. What's happening in this picture? Write a sentence about it. If you're really feeling fancy and you have two ideas that are very powerful and you want to combine them, try a semicolon. Okay. 
The next way that we can talk about clauses is we know that those were when we have two Santa clauses. We have two independent clauses. But things can get complex when you have one of each. So when we combine one independent clause with one dependent clause, we call it a complex sentence. And I always make a kind of funny joke about um, Mr. and Mrs. Claus, like once you get males and females together in a relationship, things get complex. The older the kids, the more funny they find that. But complex, it's a great way for you to build a story around the vocabulary of language. Okay, so a dependent clause is a clause that has a subordinating conjunction. So sub means under, so it can't stand alone. It has to be under another one. And we, here are the most common subordinating conjunctions. So if I just said, when the salmon leapt, what, right? It leaves you at the end of a sentence. And I, I give the example with kids, if you went up to someone in the mall and you just had a sentence with a subordinating conjunction and you left it, they would be like, what, right? You could say, although I was going to buy you a coffee, and then you walk away, it leaves you hanging. You're like at the edge of a cliff, like what, right? Finish your thought. Because subordinating conjunctions have to be joined with an independent clause for it to make sense. Because the roads were slippery. When I win the lottery. What, when you win the lottery, what, right? If you don't stop dancing. These are still clauses, they have a subject. Who doesn't stop dancing? You, subject. What do you do? You don't stop dancing, predicate. So it still has a subject and predicate, but it's not, it's not complete because this subordinating conjunction makes it depend on something else. And there are two ways, oh, let's, sorry. There are two ways that we can punctuate or combine independent and dependent clause. The first one is if you have an independent clause that comes first in your sentence, you're good to go. No comma is needed. If somebody says, can you show me your ID? I just like, don't even pause. I just give them my ID. No comma necessary. But if the dependent clause comes first, then you need to have a comma. So when I win the lottery, comma, I'm going to give the money to my favorite teacher, Mrs. Luna, period, right? And then we just play around a lot with this. So I love pizza, independent clause. Who loves pizza? I, subject. What do I do? I love, right? Predicate, complete sentence. Because it is our Friday night tradition, still has a subject and a predicate, but it wouldn't make sense by itself. So if I join my independent and my dependent, my ID, I don't need any kind of punctuation. I love pizza because it's our, our Friday night tradition. If I start with a dependent clause, because I love pizza, or I'm sorry, because it's our Friday night tradition, I love pizza, then you need a, a pause. And I actually show kids that when we're just speaking, we use these all the time, and we naturally do this. We naturally, when we start with a dependent clause, we naturally kind of have a little pause or take a breath there. Okay, so let's try it. So I want you to look at this picture and let's just together as a class brainstorm some sentences, but I want you to have at least one independent clause and one dependent clause. So one of your clauses is going to start with a subordinating conjunction. Tell me your thoughts. How about this? Since I studied, I aced the difficult math test. I aced the difficult math, te math test because I studied. Same idea, you can see how varying the sentence structure, it sophisticates your writing a little bit, right? All right, you try one. Or get with a partner. Or maybe have orange and yellow sheets of paper cut and build your sentences that way, right? So then they can really see that it's still two, in, two independent or two clauses, it still has a subject and a predicate for each. I'm not expanding my sentence. I'm combining two great sentences in powerful ways. Okay, that may take more than one week. You might do compound sentences for a week or two. You might do complex sentences for a week or two. You're going to keep 
teaching them and exposing them to the, these patterns and having them practice and write them. And you can show their growth and you can see their growth in that packet. And then when they do an independent sentence and it's nailed, they've got it, then you know that it's time to move on. Now, again, remember our 80-20 rule, you're gonna move on when 80% of the class has it and you're gonna keep um, you're gonna keep practicing with that other 20% or doing some rate teach or giving them multi-sensory. Idea number four, this is the last one. Phrases give our readers more information and clarity. Phrases can be very simple or very, very complex. And you can determine the level of complexity that your kids are ready for. So here's the definition of a phrase. A phrase is a group of words that carry meaning but does not have a subject or a predicate. So this is like the opposite of a clause. A clause can stand alone, it has a subject and a, well, that's not true. A clause has a subject and a predicate, and if it's independent, it can stand alone. Phrases can never stand alone. If you just say a phrase to someone, it will be a fragment every time because it doesn't have a subject and it doesn't have a predicate. You can remove the most phrases and the sentence will still make sense. There are some complicated phrases like the gerund phrase that it doesn't make sense because the phrase is the subject, but most typically you're gonna do that way later in elementary or, um, or beyond. Here are the three basic phrases that I'm going to teach. Introductory phrases, prepositional phrases, and my favorite, a positive phrases. So let's take a look. Introductory phrases we use to introduce or transition our reader to a next idea and give them more information. We do these all the time when we talk. First I did this, then I did this. After that, he said, we naturally give our listeners phrases so that they can follow our story. And we need to do that in our writing as well. So introductory phrases can help our audience know when we are, when we are going to talk about the next topic. These transitional phrases are often prepositional phrases. And our, re our kids already know what prepositions are and what prepositional phrases are because we've already introduced that concept in expanding sentences. So this time I'm just using prepositional phrases at the beginning of my sentence to show when, right? Because we know prepositional phrases show position of time and place. So in the beginning, no one knew who this tall young lawyer was. After that, he continued to amaze everyone with his leadership skills. That's not all. He wanted to be on the, he went on to be, the, okay, sorry, he, that's not all. He went on to become the most impactful president of the United States. To conclude, Abraham Lincoln is my favorite historian. So not all introductory phrases are prepositional phrases, but a lot of them are because they're transitioning on us and telling us the position of time. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so when we start with a, um, an introductory clause, we must, or sorry, let me start again. When we start with an introductory phrase, we must use a comma before our real clauses. Prepositional phrases, this should just be a review. These introductory phrases give more information so our audience can have a clear understanding. Prepositional phrases can be used as introductory phrases, but they can also be other places in the sentence. So, in addition to being late, she didn't bring a gift at all. So, in addition to being late, I can completely take that out and put it aside. She didn't bring a gift is my complete sentence. That's my clause. Who didn't bring a gift? She. What didn't she do? Didn't bring a gift. But I can take out in addition to being late and it still makes sense. After two hours, the girl was still being rude at the birthday party. This one actually has two prepositional phrases. After two hours tells us about time. The girl was still being rude is my clause. And at the birthday party is telling us location, right? And notice that when you start with a prepositional phrase, you need a comma, but you don't need a comma when it ends the sentence. At just the right moment, mom brought out the cake and made everyone smile. This is again a, a position of time. 
And we show kids, we can take those out and the sentences still make sense. They can be at the beginning and then you need a comma. They can be at the end and then you don't. And then we play with them, right? Use a comma after an introductory phrase. Use a comma with a sentence beginning with a prepositional phrase. And story structure is a great, 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 great time because it has a beginning, middle, and end. It has time. It's chronological. And so stories of any kind, this might be um, too primary for older kids. This would be a great time to be like, hey, about that novel we just finished, let's write some, let's write a summary using introductory phrases. And then finally, we have the appositive phrase. We can use an appositive phrase to make sure our audience knows who or what we're talking about. It is opposed or set aside and makes positive that we understand. So sometimes in our text, I'm like, I don't even know who that character is, but my, my author paused to define it and tell me about it right there in the sentence. Sometimes I can figure out vocabulary words because the definition is right there in an appositive phrase. Charlotte, a wise spider, created a plan to save the pig. If I'd never read Charlotte's Web, if I just said Charlotte created a plan, it's a complete sentence, but I don't really understand, right? So as an author, as a writer, or even a speaker, I can make positive that my, my audience knows where I say, Charlotte, a wise spider, created a plan to save pig. Brian Robeson, a 13-year-old boy, survived alone in the wilderness for 54 days. Last one. It gives you the definition. And I do a multi-sensory thing where when I'm teaching a positive phrases, I actually take a step forward. I pause, like I do a dramatic pause, step forward, read the appositive phrase, and then step back into my sentence. And it's a visual of this is opposed, this is put aside, but it's giving me more information. And if you don't read it like that when you're reading text, it's not going to make sense if you run right over those commas and just say, um, Charlotte a Spider's Web created. I'm sorry, Charlotte a Spider created. It, it makes it confusing. And a lot of kids' reading comprehension breaks down because they don't understand this syntactic move that the author did. And it doesn't make sense. They're not reading it correctly. And it just makes the meaning lost in the sentence. So if you teach them to notice the positive phrases, to read them correctly, and then also to write with them, their comprehension is going to increase as is their writing. We need to use a comma before and after our positive phrases. So notice that I have Charlotte, comma, a wise spider, comma, because I'm literally setting that part of the sentence aside for a minute. And that is my, the comma is my visual cue of that. So let's try it. Tigger, the most energetic and spastic of friends, always had great ideas. Eeyore, the mopey, depressed friend, always said, oh, bother, right? So giving kids really um, clear ways of like, ooh, what if somebody didn't have ever have any experience with Winnie the Pooh? How could you give them a little definition right there in the sentence that you're talking about so that they make positive that you they know who you are? Or I could say, um, because he was always bossy, comma, rabbit, comma, the annoying friend, comma, um, always dictated the plan, or whatever it is. So you're showing kids all, all ways that you can do this. The next thing is that you are pointing out all of this as many times as you can. So repeated exposure, this is not a grammar lesson that you're doing in a 20 minute block of your morning and then you're not talking about it again until the next grammar lesson, this is going to be something that every time I'm reading, I pause when I'm like, whoop, 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 take a step back. Did you see what the author just did there? 
that wasn't a positive phrase. They gave me the definition right in the sentence. And then I go back and I reread it and I put my body language forward and back. And then I'm like, read that positive phrase with me. And then when kids are reading, they can start practicing that. And then I point out like, whoa, did you hear how um, John just read that a positive phrase and he paused at, at the, right the right places so that we could comprehend better? And so I'm building this idea that all of these are connected. They're integrated into all parts of language. They're integrated into all content areas. They're integrated into our reading. They're integrated into our writing. I'm pointing out and modeling them as I'm writing everything on the board. I'm going to, I'm going to give back that callback of subject predicate because my kids that are struggling or have a language deficit are going to benefit tremendously. This is going to be so impactful in their language comprehension in general and really, really important for their reading comprehension and their writing. So if you break it down to just those four big ideas, it doesn't seem as daunting as we're gonna learn 72 concepts in grammar this year, right? We're gonna learn four big ideas in language this year. That is, that's manageable, that's doable. And you can use this as maybe you teach fourth or fifth grade and you can use this as a week for each pattern as kind of a refresh and review if you've already done this, but showing these patterns in very simplistic ways, in very purposeful, authentic ways. Or if you're teaching from scratch and your kids truly don't know basic parts of speech or never heard of subject predicate, you can extend this and have this be however long it takes for them to kind of get this, this out. So I hope that that was helpful. I hope it broke down for you what syntax is and how you can teach it effectively. I'll see you next time.